All right, 126 on. All agreed? Say, uh, Folks, remember the microphone is very sensitive, so if you're saying anything, you are now being recorded. Thank you. I love you. Are we doing the soul or the descent of the soul? <laughs> Which one are we working on? The soul or the descent of the soul? We did the descent. Yes. So we're on 125 or 6 or something like that. Okay. Look here. Idea of the soul, three things. Okay. In the Phaedo, okay, in, in Plato's Phaedo, he has the idea of death, philosophical death, as a yoga. And what he says is that he calls the yoga a purification. in a special way. He says, it's necessary to bring together from all parts of the body, say, the soul, from all parts, of, therefore, the idea of soul is what it brings life to the body. And it's capable of being collected together and exist free of the body as you can see in this beautiful picture of the soul. That's the condition for experiencing the nature of reality, being. And in the Phaedo, he said, hey, that's true philosophy, everything else is not. So you can check that yourself. That's somewhere around 67 to 69 in the Stephanus numbers. Okay, second. soul, there is something that plans, coordinates plans, sets them in motion, will, and seeks whatever it is for itself to benefit itself or care. Right? Whatever it that is within us that does that, whatever it is in us that plans, that wills the plans that we design because we think it may benefit us, whatever does that in the Republic, that is soul. So there's a rational, Right? There's a rational part and also a vitality. Third, okay. from, the, from the Timaeus, he says, you know what? The very nature of the universe, there is pure being. And there are two kinds of, of uh, pure being. It's a part that is divisible and non-divisible.
because this idea of being in the time is, is usia, that which is capable of turning upon itself and knowing itself. So, therefore, it's non-divisible and taken it as a whole, but yet you can make, you can talk about it as if it had different stages. He says, you know what? You gotta get these two together. You mix them. You have to do that using being. And you mix them together. That is soul with a capital S. And he says, therefore, once that makes it spread throughout the universe, so all the universe has soul, capital S. Therefore, the problem is, see, it's divisible individuals. You can also talk about us, or for those of you who are into grammar, it's us's, which is plural for us. Right, David? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, That's the archaic Indo-Aryan root, isn't it? I say I if you put an so. S on the end of anything, you got a plural. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's the riddle. What's the relationship between the soul, capital S, sometimes cosmic or world soul, and within us. Does that mean there are parts of this and each one of us is a particular part of it? What kind of language can we use to understand these two things? That's the goal. That's where he's going. Got it? That's the goal. So given this, Given this, given this. That's where we go. Okay. So, when you get into the section on soul, the first couple of sections are pretty obvious. <laughs> and therefore, we can jump into section three. Now, I made a test of this to make sure it was obvious, and I tried it out and on the, some people on the campus. And everyone I showed it to, they said it was obvious. Uh, who did you show it to? That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, see whether or not we're right where, right where we should be on 129. <clears throat> Our souls, parts of the soul in the same sense that in an organism the soul that is in the finger it could be called a part of the soul, the total soul that's in the entire body. See, it goes to this, goes to this. Soul also is a vitality. Essential potential. 129. See, so it could even be in the big toe, as you can see in this beautiful picture. 4.3. Same language, fingers. So would you want to say that whatever it is that has vitality, see the word soul is a bad word. All right, psyche is better. Because the word psyche is linked to the idea of breath, vitality. And we pick up the idea of soul in a different way. But in any case, okay. So this is the question he raises. Given this statement, you want to say that the vitality in the toe or the finger is a part of the soul? In the same way that the pages of this book are parts of a book and therefore they're separable and I can tear them out. So the question is going to be, what do we mean by parts a whole? 
when we talk about soul. That's where we're going. This theory would admit either that no soul is outside a body, or that every soul is not in a body, and that the soul is outside the body of the world. Ah, this is a point that we'll, be, uh, we'll have to examine later, and thank goodness that's on another page. For the moment, Let's examine the following comparison. <clears throat> if the soul is, is accorded to all particular organisms, as the individual soul is to each part of the organism, and if each soul is in the same sense a part of the soul, it should be noted that divided, it would uh, not be itself that the soul would give to the individual organism. It, you know what? It ought to be everywhere the same, everywhere entire, one, and present to many beings at one and the same time. Right. So when we get it, we get the whole, present to us completely. Otherwise, a person would have the right to go to uh, Walmart and say, look, I had a damaged soul. Let me have a fresh, clean one and they give it to you for a modest price. So everyone gets it. Whole, present, complete. There's no longer a question of a soul that is a part against a soul that is an all, especially when an identical power is present. Because if the function of one part is different from that from another, that of seeing from hearing, it cannot be said that the part of the soul that is concerned with seeing is different from the one hearing. Huh. Such distinctions we can leave to others another quote somewhere else. It's the same soul, although a different faculty acts in each of the two cases. But in each of these two faculties are all the others implicitly. Difference of perception comes only from the difference of the organis organs. Hey, you know what? All perception is perception of forms. Huh, this proves that all impressions must uh, reach a unique center. Well, if each of the organs is capable of receiving all the impressions, each organ has its distinct impressions. Yeah. Yeah. So, look. He says, you know, the senses, all of the senses, that it is through the senses, right? It's through the senses that we see. The eye doesn't do the seeing, it's through the eye we do the seeing. And now he comes back and he says, whatever is seen or heard is received, and there's something here that pulls it all together. And you can say, hey, look here, I see this person, I hear this person, I can understand what the person is saying, I'm using a lot of senses, am I not? And mind? There must be something in me that pulls all of those together into a unity. So... It's a unity. Everywhere present has, it has different 
functions, that's all. It's one, but it can function through the organs of the senses and therefore function differently, but it's one through the senses, creating different forms brought together into a unity. Therefore, you know what? The soul is rational and as universal as it is rational. Huh. Huh. So we go back to this. Capital. It's rational. Wow. That's interesting, you see? Hmm. All over the place, universal. And what shares in it, therefore, is uh, rational. Hmm. It must, it's a puzzle. He's got to work this out. And that's why he has section four. <coughs> And that's why we do not agree we should get someone to read the next paragraph. <coughs> he looks yeah. like a reader. Yeah. How about it? Go slow, loud. If the soul is one in this way, what are we to say in answer to queries about the consequences? The first difficulty to be raised will be this. Is a unity possible that is simultaneously present in all things? Again, what happens when the soul is in body, but a particular soul is not? Perhaps the consequence will be that every soul is always in a body, and the soul especially, because it is not said to abandon the body as ours is. Some people say that our soul will leave this particular body, but will never be completely unembodied. But assuming that it is going to be completely out of the body, how will the soul leave the body and not the soul when they are the same? No such difficulty stands in our way. Okay, just for one moment. No. One of the problems for, for Plotinus is that <coughs> this separation, this separation of the soul from the body, is it complete? That's one of the questions. Is it complete? Or is there a part that still remains? Because if it is completely separated, then how does it get back in? How does it find its home again? What would be the process of reincarnating in the body? If there's a part that's always hanging on, then it's like a rubber band, stretched out, comes back, no problem. All you have to do is explain the expansion, that's all. But if it's complete, then you have that extra problem. Now for Plato, it's complete. For Plotinus, it's not. And for Plotinus, well, okay. Uh, now, here we go back now to this. He's going to say, I'll tell you what, we need to focus on the soul. And therefore, thank goodness, we have a new paragraph. Sure. 
no such difficulty stands in our way where the intelligence is, con <coughs> is concerned because it is differentiated into distinct parts that nevertheless remain together because its substance is undivided. But for the soul, of which we speak as being distributed among bodies, this unity of all souls presents many difficulties. Yeah. Got it. There's a real problem, isn't there? Does he recognize it? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Keep going. See, if each of these has a particular unity, if each of the souls has a particular unity, and in some way it returns, then wouldn't the right way to look at this is to say that in soul is a whole bunch of particular unities? It's a puzzle. Okay, let's see how he does it. So what are we after? Two things. Unity, and see, each one has a unity, so he has to talk about unity that each has. And what would happen then if they're separated? He's got the next problem. Would you not agree he's got another one that he has to handle? If he has the idea of reincarnation, then he also has the problem of, well, where is that particular unity? Does it hang around waiting to be reborn? And then does it then incarnate in the body? Does that require an explanation? Yeah. Why that one, not others? Why this particular one in that particular body? You know, he's got several good problems. And good heavens, that's why there's more to go. We'd like to give a tough one on the next one. It's a good one. Good. Perhaps one might establish the unity as something existing independently, which does not fall into body, and all the others, the soul and the rest, as depending upon it. They would be, to a certain extent, altogether one single soul, because they are not souls of particular organisms, connected with the higher unity by their fringes, united in their upper parts and striking out in different directions, like the light on the earth, spreading itself among the houses without being split up, all the while remaining one. The soul would always remain transcendent, because it would have nothing to do with descent to the lower, or any tendency towards the things here below. Our souls would come down because their place would be marked off for them in this sphere, and because they turn to those things that need their care. The soul, in its lowest part, would be like the soul in a great and growing plant that directs the plant effortlessly and in silence. The individual soul in its lowest part would be like maggots in a rotting part of the plant, because that is what the ensouled body is like in the totality of existence. The, the, the rest of the soul, which is of the same nature as the higher parts of the soul, would be like a gardener concerned about the maggots in the plant and carefully caring for it. Or it would be like a healthy man living with other healthy, healthy men and aiding them with his action or contemplation and a sick man concerned with the care of his body, at the service of his body, and absorbed with it. Okay, how does he solve it? First stage, what does he say? There's a difference between the world soul and individual souls. One is transcendent, the other is not. How does he account for the difference? <coughs> we do not agree, Jeff, that we should call on our colleague for help? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. How does he count for the difference? Um, the soul yeah. does not letter. descend. 
It's transcendent. It's above it all. That's right. Well. Wow. So they're each marked for a destiny. Come and take sure, care. Sure, sure. What? They say they're each marked as a destiny. So they have to come down to take care. Ah, of it yeah. All. So they don't care when yeah. the other one doesn't care. That's the soul. Individual souls. They need to care. They need to care for what without it would fall apart, not exist. Therefore, we are like, what's the image he uses? Light on the earth. Well, gardeners. Like gardeners, yeah. Right. And that's why the human race is so careful about the earth, because we care for everything on the earth, and no one would be so foolish as to Wait a minute, is that Let's right? go back to the maggots. It's still close. The maggots, is that a good one? The maggots? I like <laughs> that one. Back a little closer, yeah. <coughs> uh -huh. <coughs> well, wait a while. I mean, the soul has no care for souls. Caring only starts with the human or living things. That's rather curious. Well, we got one part of the puzzle. There's a need in the cosmos. <coughs> Mankind serves that need. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, that's a good one. Bless you too. So, would you not agree where we're going then? Is each individual souls, not these, let's take this out. Each individual soul, separate and unique. And that's why we need another section. Think it would be fair to call in Barbara? No, I'd no. rather not, really. Thank well, you. Well, only if you can get a volunteer. I'm sure. Jack will volunteer. Okay, instead. Jack. Fame comes your way. Five. But, on this supposition, how can there be one soul that is yours, a second soul that is another man's, and a third that is yet another's? In the lower order, are they the souls of particular individuals, yet in a higher order the souls of that higher unity? This would mean that Socrates would exist as long as Socrates' soul is in the body and would cease to exist when he attains perfection. Now no real being ever ceases to exist. In the intelligible realm of the intelligence or er, intelligences, in the or sorry, in the intelligible realm, the intelligences, because they are not divided among bodies, do not cease to exist. Each continues to exist, complete, distinct in its own, in its common being. Souls depend upon the intelligences, are the expressions of the intelligences. They're further unfolding. They come from the intelligences as a large number, oh, as a large number comes from a small. They are linked to their sources as to what are less manifold than they. They, des they desire manifoldness, but do not achieve it. They preserve both identity and difference. Each is subsistent being, but all are one together. <coughs> Our argument is summarized thus. All souls come from one soul, as intelligences come from the intelligence, separated and yet not separated. The soul which remains, is the unique expression of the intelligence, and from it come the partial expressions of the intelligible realm. Ooh, what did he just add? Yeah. Now, Jacqueline is in that same situation of, hey, you know what? I know every single word I read, <laughs> and I can link up many phrases. But as to the meaning of the whole, 
Let's just quickly go to the summary and then work back, okay? Do the summary again, watch. See okay. what we need? You see, we started out, did we not, by saying, look here, see? The soul plans, wills, and cares. Its job is, therefore, cares, see? It cares. Well, that's its job, to care, to care for others, to care for living things. But to plan, will, and to care presupposes a rational structure. But rational presupposes there must be something higher, and that is intelligence. That's what we uh, say. So then, in some way, we have to then participate because we plan, will, and care, and we relate to one another, and we have a care for living things. That presupposes not just rational, but something higher, because the source of rationality is intelligence. Now remember, his word intelligence is going to be fun. That presupposes that there is intellect or the eye of the soul. There's some process of intellecting that presuppose there must be something intelligible. That's behind the word intelligence. Right? Ence, right? That's what's behind it. Now, you know what that means? You know what's curious about this? To therefore, if souls participate in this intelligence, then they are, in that way, bringing down to themselves this power of intelligence, or the eye of the soul, as it's sometimes called. Huh. Uh, then it's transformed by that participation. Then after death does it, see after death, remember, not physical death, this. This is death, separation of the soul from the body. Whether it takes place now or hereafter doesn't make any difference. Does the separation of the soul from the body therefore mean it reaches into the very nature of reality? What's another word for reality? Right here, intelligence. And that's why in the Phaedo, somewhere around 81 or so, he gives a description of what that's like. He says, hey, in the Republic, you see what happens after you get that? There's a part of you that wakes up. <coughs> the eye of the soul wakes up, and it's now yours to use. Before that, it's asleep. He said, that's the goal. So pull the stunt, stunt off, and then as a consequence of this, it awakens the intellect, the eye of the soul, and now you can see in a different way than you had before. Except for women. Especially <laughs> women. Isn't that true? Yeah. See? <laughs> Why? Because they're women. Because they got it from birth. <laughs> Otherwise, how do they possibly bring up kids? Right. God, I never had you. Would you ever bring one up? Not, not, no. They do it. You know how fast they do it? Quick. Don't even go to school. Huh? All right, they're not dumb broads either. Is that, let me check. Do you agree? Yeah, see? Write it down. <laughs> All souls come from one soul as intelligences come from the intelligence. Separated yet not separated. The soul which remains is the unique expression of the intelligence. That's capital, the soul. 
and from it comes partial expressions of the intelligible realm, which is us. Right? Now I like the next one, right? This world soul, right, what does it do? Right. It then creates the condition for the cosmos. So the soul, the soul, creates the conditions for the cosmos. So what do we create with our soul? Conditions for chaos. <laughs> oh wait, that was wrong. I, a misreading of the text. We create fantasies. What? Fantasies. Fantasies and dangerous <coughs> belief. And if you paint them enough and loyal to them, you'll act exactly like the fantasies. So you, life is nothing other than acting out daydreams and fantasies, which is why we have such an intelligible life. And no one has a problem. Except Everyone. people in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> so then, are you describing then a uh, four-part mm -hmm. analogy? As the soul is to the cosmos, our souls are to our fantasies. Well, the, yeah, but that's not in Plotinus. I was just sneaking it in, oh, hoping sorry. no one heard it. N never mind. Never okay. Mind. Since you did so well, why don't you pick it up from there? Number six. Right. Six and seven are important. Jump in. Rep up. No. Loud. <clears throat> But how is it that while the soul has produced a cosmos, the soul has not? Although it is of the, of, I'm sorry, although it is of the one same sort and contains it to all things in itself. We have already said that one and the same thing can enter and exist in many things at the same time. Now it is necessary to say how this cosmos comes about. I'm sorry, how, how this comes about then perhaps one will know how the same thing, <clears throat> inserted in different things, accomplishes a particular action and is subject to a particular passion, or acts and reacts at the same time. First, however, it is necessary to examine the question in itself. How has the soul made the world and why, while individual souls govern each part of the world? Right. How has the <clears throat> soul made the world of the cosmos, and why, while individual souls govern each part of the world? Got his question? Hold on to it. Well, Charge him. Yes. Well, we are not surprised that, among men who possess the same knowledge, some govern a large number and others a small number of people. Agree? Mm -hmm. Was that helpful? <clears throat> That's the example. Go ahead. Okay. But why, one might ask, is this. The answer might be that there is great difference between souls. Some, never having fallen away from the soul, dwell within it and assume body within it, while others received their allotted spheres when the body was already in existence. When the soul, their kin, was already in control, and, as it were, had already prepared in, in habitations for them. It is also possible that there is a soul that contemplates the intelligence while other souls are only the partial intelligences upon which they depend. Perhaps they might still be able to produce the world, but as the soul has already done so, they are no longer able to. They have been anticipated. This same difficulty would remain if any other soul, of whatever sort, had been the first. But it, were, it, but it were better to say that the soul has made the cosmos. Its position is firmer in the superior realm. Souls that tend towards the intelligible realm have the greater strength. They husband it in security, and they act with ease. For great strength takes a sting out of action. This strength on high, <coughs> this strength on high remains on high. Mm. The soul remains in itself and acts upon things that draw nigh to it. 
On the contrary, the other souls go forth, which can mean only that they have deserted towards the abyss. The multiplicity in these souls is drawn downward and draws along with it the souls themselves and their thinking. The secondary and tertiary souls, of which we hear, must be understood in the sense of a closer or a more remote position in regard to the intelligible realm. Quite as among us, all souls have not the same relation to intellectual things. Some make them their own. Others have an impression of them and desire them. Still others are much less apt. The reason is that they do not act with the same faculty. Some use the highest faculties, others that which is lower, still others the third, although all souls possess all the faculties. Okay. How do we account for the fact that there are differences among souls? They participate more or less fully in the intelligence. The more so, then he gives those qualities that you just read, right? These participate in this more fully. These are kind of ignore it and live out their existences without any contact. Therefore, they have different lives, different destinies. Tony? Well, I, was, I had a question, so I'm different than that. But I was, I was curious about the soul does it mimic. The reason why I asked that question is due to, like, say, to psychologists, you know, say, dealing with a certain particular person that don't understand his behavior patterns. And then they try to tell him how it should be, or whatever way they should react in life. So would that be a mimic thing, or why would they? How could it be one? don't understand and the one does. So that's why I was wondering, trying to understand that in the soul, you know, when someone teaches so, you. And what's he saying? He's saying, what do you have to do? Turn towards it. Towards it, yeah, the intelligence. Then you gain strength, you live differently. Is that what he's saying in that paragraph? Right, yeah. Let's pull out a key couple of key terms. Thanks. Come on, look at it. <laughs> They have greater strength, they husband it in security, and they <coughs> act with ease. Hey, it takes the sting out of action. That's a major point for him later. This strength on high remains on high. Equally well, next paragraph. The closer or the more remote position in regard to the intelligible realm accounts for all the secondary souls. The reason is that they do not act with the same faculties. Some use the highest faculties, others that which is lower. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now he goes into the Philebus, right, which is the great section on the dialectic and how you make divisions. Mm -hmm. Right, so Okay, we're jumping now into two dialogues, the Phaedipus and the time is. I have a question. What's the example of the lower soul? <laughs> well, it would, by contrast, it would be those that have very little strength, and therefore they can't also, see, without strength they can't plan the way they would like, they lack the willpower. Mm -hmm. And they have less care for themselves and others, and therefore they live accordingly. 
is the secondary souls. Mm. Thank you. So, Barbara, is it fair to call on Regina? To it read? is. I, I do believe so. Okay, okay. Start. So far, so good. Seven. So far, <coughs> so good. But what of the passage in the Philebus that implies that other souls are parts of the soul? No. Parts. Focus on the word parts. Go ahead. This statement of Plato has not the meaning that some people believe to see in it. It signifies, as it was useful for Plato, to have it signify in this instance that the heavens are animated. He proves it in saying that it is absurd to think that the heavens are without a soul, since we who possess a part of the body of the universe have a soul. For how could there be a soul in the part and none in the whole? Further, his thought is particularly clear in the Timaeus. Once the soul is begotten, the Demiurgus makes other souls, but compounded from the same mixing bowl. He makes them accordingly of the same pieces, species, as the soul, as the soul, and makes them different only by their ranking second or third. Now, this is what is called the mixing bowl. <coughs> as to the phrase from the Phaedrus, the soul in its totality has the care of all that is inanimate. It is true. What is that? What is it that controls bodily nature, sets it in order and builds it up except the soul? It is not true that there is power in the nature of one soul and none in the other, nature of others. The perfect soul, the soul, going its lofty journey, as we read, operates upon the cosmos, not by sinking into it, but, as it were, by brooding over it. And every perfect soul exercises this governance. Plato distinguishes the other, the, the other. Plato distinguishes the other, the soul in this sphere, as a soul that has shed its wings. As for our souls, being entrained in the cosmic circuit and taking character and condition from it, this is no indication that they are part of the soul. The soul is able to receive many impressions of the nature of places, water, and air. Residents in this city or in that and the varying makeup of the body may have their influence upon our souls, and yet not parts of a place. I didn't understand that. Yeah, just back it off. Let's see. Um, as for our souls being entrained in the cosmic circuit and taking ca character and condition from it. Oh, I see. I didn't see the mm -hmm. comment. Condition from it. This is no indication that they are part of the soul. The soul is able to receive many impressions of the nature of places, water, and air. Now, residents in this city or in that and the varying makeup of the body may have their influence upon our souls and yet are not parts of place or of body. Oh, I see. We have always admitted that as citizens of the universe, we take something from the soul of the universe. We also admit the influence of the cosmic circuit. But against all this, we oppose another soul in us, which shows that it is another precisely because of the res resistance it offers. The fact remains that we are engendered at the interior of the universe. But the infant in its mother's womb, <coughs> was a distinct soul, the soul that enters its body, is not its mother's soul. Okay. I didn't understand that paragraph. It seemed like it had many parts, but 
and get it literally many parts. Pick it up again from we have always admitted. Got it? We also admit that we have always admitted that as citizens. It's two lines above that. Oh, sorry. We have always admitted that as citizens of the universe, we take something from the soul of the universe. We also admit the influence of the cosmic circuit. But against all this, we oppose another soul in us, which shows that it is a another precisely because of the resistance it offers. The fact remains that we were engendered at the interior of the universe. But the infant in its mother's womb has a distinct soul. The soul that enters its body is not its mother's soul. So we're influenced by being citizens of the universe, right? The whole cosmic circuit, the, all the heavens moving, the planets moving, right? But we oppose another soul, and you know why? Because <laughs> we have resistance to it, and that shows that we are separate. The fact remains that we were engendered at the interior of the universe, and that's the soul. That's how we're doing. Oh, I see. Now, I like the next sentence, Good. but much more the ones that follow. Thus are these difficulties resolved. I don't know whether we may have to go back over it, <laughs> but here's the one that I like. All right? That sympathy exists between souls offers no obstacle to my thesis. Remember, he said it's because of resistance that we recognize mm -hmm. that we are separate. Souls are responsive to one another because they all come from the same soul, the soul. <clears throat> Therefore, all people should respect everyone. Because you're respecting the source, the soul. Right? which participates in intelligence. <clears throat> we have already explained that there is the soul, <clears throat> unique, and souls multiple. And how there is a different relation, relationship of parts of the whole, as well as the diversity in general of souls among themselves, now we may add briefly that differences may be induced also by the bodies with which the soul has to do, and even more, by the character and mental operations carried over from the living of the previous lives. Right. How do you account for the range of differences of souls and how they function? He's now adding reincarnation. And their kind of view of karma. It's not, there's a big difference between karma here and elsewhere, but just generally. We read, in fact, that souls choose a life conformable to their previous lives. Just like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, only this work happens to be 1,500 years earlier. Uh, no. <coughs> thousand years old. Okay. okay. And now we're into the more interesting part as regards the nature of soul in general. The differences have been pointed out in the passage in which mention was made of secondary and tertiary orders and it's been laid down that while all souls are all comprehensive, each ranks in conformity to the faculty that in it exercises in activity. 
One is united to the intelligible realm in reality. Another, only in thought. A third, desire. Each contemplating different things and has become what it contemplates. That's central to all of Plotinus, right there. We become what we contemplate. That's it. That's what drives the whole system. Therefore, you know, plentitude and perfection are not the same for all souls. But since they form a systematic whole full of variety, the entities form a system and are not totally scattered. Chance does not rule among them since it does not even rule in the body. The number of entities is consequently a determinate number. On the other hand, beings remain stable. Intelligibles ought to be identical with themselves, each numerically one. Thus it is that there is a determinate being, being. Now he shifts back to the souls. In a body, the individual characteristics develop naturally because it has received a specific form and there is never reality except in imitation of authentic realities. Don't lose that central principle. Authentic realities do not rise out of any conjunction as that of form and matter, since they have their being in what is numerically one. It was from the beginning, and it becomes what it has not been, nor ceases to be what it is. Hey, you know what? Let's suppose for a moment there were an agent that brings them into existence. They would not be produced from matter since uh, they would not be composites. The productive principle then would infuse into them from within itself something of its own substances. Then there would be in it a change depending upon whether in any given moment it produced more or less. But what would be the reason that it should produce at one moment and not produce always in the same fashion? Hmm. Further, the produced total variable from more to less could not be eternal. Yeah, so that's the end of it. How can a thing be infinite if it's determinate? Sure of infinity of power. and a power can be infinite without being divided infinitely. Uh, you know, example is divinity is, is not a finite being. I just got two paragraphs to wrap it there. He said, hey, you know what, the truth of the matter is souls then are what they are and do not receive their determinations from elsewhere. Each has the quantity it itself chooses. Without ever going beyond itself, it penetrates everywhere throughout the body, whether it's nature, right? Whether it is its nature to penetrate. It is never separated from itself, foot or finger. It penetrates body entire. This it does, for example, in each several part of a plant and even a part cut off from the stem. <coughs> it, is the same, it is at the same time in the plant and in the part cut off. Yeah, for the body of the whole is a body that is one. I'm skipping down into the next paragraph for a moment. <coughs> The soul which continues in its unity. <coughs> Got it? 
just as with ourselves, some elements are shed, others grow in their places. The soul abandons the discarded and flows into the newcomer as long as soul subsists in body. But in the cosmos, the soul subsists eternally.